Yes. Yeah. Khakis are good. Um, ladies' dresses, skirts, dress pants are good. Anything you want to do there? There's a small amount of ladies here today. Way to be here. One, two, three. This side and this side is overwhelming. Okay. Okay, so um, what time do you need to be here that morning? 8.30. What time? 8.30.
So, uh, join me while I'll, I'll say number one. You guys get to say it with me. Do you trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And do you intend to be his disciple, obey his word, and show his love? Do you? Okay, and then say the second one with me. Will you be a faithful member of this congregation by participating in responsible education, worship, by using your gifts to ministry, and through the financial support? And will you seek the fellowship of the church wherever you may go? Will you? And it's really that kind of that second one that we're going to talk about today. We kind of talked about, you know, trusting in Jesus Christ, trying to be his disciple. Um, and now it's like this also the second part is that we're joining this community. And what does that exactly mean? Some of the things, responsible education. Do you guys know what is meant by that? Responsible education. I think it means coming to worship, listening to sermons, listening to one of Josh's talks. That you're in the word, that you're getting to know God, that sort of thing. Worship by using your gifts in ministry. We need you and your gifts um, here as a part of this church. Financial support and um, just being a part of the fellowship. So give me the next slide. Okay, so um, Erin Griggs used to be in charge of confirmation. And one of my favorite lines that she always said was that... Um, you know, it's not that going to church makes you a Christian in the same way that going to McDonald's doesn't make you a hamburger. Um, <laughs> you know, like, just because you're showing up at church doesn't mean that that's actually why you're a Christian. Instead, uh, I want to kind of define the word church, and I get really excited because I'm kind of a theology nerd. So anytime I get to use a, a Greek word in real life, being that I had to study Greek words for a whole year, when I get to actually use it, it's kind of fun. Um... So the Greek uh, word, the original word in the Bible that was church was this word, and it's ekklesia in English. And also I have to point out that when you study Greek, it's really annoying because like this word, the N, it looks like an N, but it's really there's the word for the long E, so it's A, ekklesia. And so they have these words, but they don't actually, it's like we stole Greek letters and moved them around, and so they aren't actually representing the ones that you think they are, so... Anyway, that's why Greek is hard. So, ekklesia actually means the gathering. So, it's not that um, church is this building. It's not that church is somewhere you go. It's actually that in the Bible, when God says uh, church, he means that um, his followers gathered together are actually called to be the church. We don't go to church. We are the church. And... Uh, the first church is kind of cool that we're reading Acts. Um, part of the sermon was on Acts today. And so I want us all to get out, grab a Bible, and find, or on your phone if you've got a Bible app, find Acts 2, 42 through 47. of the believers. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. 
Every day they continued to meet together in temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily who, those who were being saved. Awesome. Okay, so the first church, the very beginning, right as uh, right as people were starting to become followers of Jesus, not like they had church buildings. That wasn't a thing. Um, and so they had to figure out how they are going to kind of do this new kind of life together. They were so impacted by um, the life of Jesus and the fact that he rose from the dead. They had to figure out this whole new way of life together. And so um, why don't we make a list, and you can write these down in your notes too, but what were some of the characteristics you saw from that passage? Uh, raise your hand, shout one out, um, that described what a church was for these people. It was just, they weren't in a church, but they were the church together. What did that look like for them? What were, what were some of the things out of that that you can point out? Breaking bread together. Breaking bread together. There was lots. Oh. Basically the whole thing, yeah. Daily discipline of worship. Daily worship, yeah. themselves to the apostles' teachings. Okay, so they wanted to understand the teachings better. Gave to those in need. Mm -hmm. They sold their properties and possessions. Yeah, they gave up thinking things were their own and <coughs> gave them to God. Yeah. It, was there more in there or was that basically all of them? That's all of them? Okay, cool. Okay, so as you can see, uh, this first church didn't think that it was all about going to church, but rather it was <coughs> finding out a way to live together in this new way of life and to really be the church. The one, uh, oh, I remember there was one more. I don't have it in front of me, but I like the part where it said um, daily there was more being added to their numbers. It was clear that, uh, that they were telling new people about this, and so part of being a church together also meant bringing, bringing people who didn't know about it and telling them the good news. All right, next slide. All right, so uh, I have a couple kind of ways to talk about church because we talk about church in kind of this broad sense, and then we also talk about church like this is actually, we actually do call this church, right, this building, this community, SPC. And so there's really two ways to talk about it. There's Big C Church, which um, the, another word for that is Catholic. Now, that might seem kind of funny because we're not actually Catholic, but the word Catholic literally means universal. So Catholic equals universal. So Big C Church um, it means Catholic or universal. So there's this universal sense that we're all believers, so we all belong to this big universal church. All the believers across the world, throughout time and history, all part of this big universal church. And then there's this little C Church, which is like, a local church, a specific church. So it's like Sammamish Presbyterian Church, where we're in one place together, and it just describes a small part of it, okay? So uh, to kind of better explain how, like, we kind of think about the big C church versus little C church, and how, like, denominations have kind of come about, I want to kind of show you a YouTube video. These are ones, like, Josh showed, where it's like, it's so stupid, it's funny. So, you know, do it. enjoy it for what it is. Uh, hey, where are the recording statement in faith? It's in, like, the quiet room. I think. Oh, in the quiet room. So when you guys head out to your, if you get called over, head over to the quiet room. say we believe in the Holy Catholic Church if we're not Catholic. <laughs> so, a long time ago, a guy named Martin Luther nailed a piece of paper to his church door. And a whole bunch of other people called reformers quickly joined in the fun, opposing what they believed was corruption and a misrepresentation of the gospel within the Roman Church. Oh! 
These people were given the name Protestants by their opponents because they protested the wrongs they saw in the institutional church. Resistance is God's grace in your face. And ever since then, there have been a whole lot of Christians that have called themselves Protestants, i.e. non-Catholics. And yet, many of these Protestants pretty much every Sunday recite the Apostles' Creed word for word, including this little nugget, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. Whoa there, partner. Easy now. I mean, sure, us Protestants believe the Catholic Church exists. I don't. Okay, most of us believe it exists. Yep, there it is. But why would anyone need to say, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, if you're not Catholic? Well, it's not really that complicated. In fact, it's pretty simple. Uh, Ow, will you stop dropping the Bible on my head, please? Sure, no problem. Thank you. That's not a Bible. It's a dictionary. If you open it to the word Catholic... Catholic? Ew! Cats are gross! They put their tongue in you and it feels like sandpaper? Ew, that's gross! No, no cats! If you... Bad kitty! <laughs> anyway, as I was saying, if you open it to the word Catholic, you'll see something interesting. The word Catholic means universal, or universal in extent, involving all, of interest to all, and pertaining to the whole Christian body or church. All of us, everyone who believes in Jesus, and we believe in that, right? Yes, we do! But think about what that means, the whole Christian body. That's a lot of different people from a lot of different churches, even different denominations, different ways of expressing their faith, different emphases, and different priorities, all acknowledging their need for a savior. We believe in that, right? Yes, we do! But the variety doesn't stop with how we do church. Think about all the cultures. Jesus' gospel transcends race, nationality, ethnicity, and societal norms. So people with widely different ways all live in this Catholic, this universal church. People with different histories, different ways of dressing, different foods and music, different methods of living in community, different everything. And they all belong in the universal church. And we believe in that, right? Yes, we do! And guess what? Universal doesn't just mean right now. We're talking about the church throughout time. Everyone, anywhere that has ever received the gospel is bound together in the great cloud of witnesses we call the universal church. That's cool. We definitely believe in that. Yes, we do! So that's why we say we believe in the Holy Catholic Church when we recite the Apostles' Creed. Because we believe in the unity of the gospel, and we believe in human diversity. We believe that there is more that binds us together than separates us. Right? Yes, we do! So can I say something now? I have a question. Oh, uh, sure. Does this mean I'm Catholic? <sighs> Okay, so, a long time ago, a guy named Martin Luther nailed a piece of paper to his church door.
people basically wanted to get rid of him. So there was really, really, really severe persecution. People would be burned, fed to lions. Um, there was one party that a C one of the Caesars threw where literally his entertainment and lighting for the party was Christians being burned. So it's kind of crazy and brutal and um, like odd and of that time, but um, it's still crazy that to be a Christian, that was what might happen to you, and yet this religion kept growing and growing and growing. The power of the gospel was so strong that even the threat of death or persecution or torture couldn't stop this movement. And so I thought that was pretty cool. And so by the time the year 313 AD, um, the first kind of key moment in Christian history happened in the history of the church, and that's where uh, Constantine, one of the Roman emperors, uh, declared this, it was called the Edict of Milan, and it was kind of his edict, his declaration, that the whole Roman Empire would become Christian. And so the good part of that was that the influence of the church grows, a lot more people get to hear about the teachings of Jesus, and it has a really wide impact. The not-so-good part is that because it was kind of related to the state and related to government, uh, there was a lot of corruption in the church and a lot of malpractice and stuff like that. And so that's kind of, you can, the schism was kind of the Eastern Orthodox. They kind of went on their own. But really up until the year 1517 A.D., they were basically one big Catholic church until, uh, you kind of saw in the video, Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door. And that was 95 things that he saw that was wrong or abuses in the Catholic Church. And so um, he didn't go out starting out trying to make his own religion, but when people didn't respond, he decided, I have to live like an authentic faith. I have to live that way. And so he kind of started his own movement and ended up becoming the Lutherans. And out of that, out of that time, we have kind of a bunch of people that um, were kind of reforming the church, and so there was the Lutherans, the radical reformers, that's like the Mennonites, people who took what Luther was doing and made it even more extreme. And the Reformed, which was led by Calvin, that was where um, Presbyterians kind of branch out of. So Calvin's our guy. And, um, Calvin. yeah, Calvin. <coughs> um, so those were our two big kind of key moments. I put on your guys' outline a, a little thing that says what makes Presbyterians different. I don't think we're going to have time to kind of go over each of those things. But in case you guys wanted more of a description of why, are, why am I actually doing a Presbyterian denomination and what makes us unique. Like, I love that the video kind of talked about that unity with diversity. So overall, we're unified with all Christians. but. There's some diversity. There's some things that we emphasize or see as more important or ways that we organize ourselves or stuff like that. So if you want to read through some of those things or if you don't know what some of them mean and you want to ask me about it, that's totally fine. So that's kind of what makes Presbyterians a little bit different than other folks. Okay? Um, yeah, so that's kind of what led us to kind of branch off as Presbyterians. And uh, I want to show you some like key ideas that basically Luther was talking about. So give me the next slide. These are key ideas about the Reformation and the Reformed tradition, which is part of the Protestant, the Reformed tradition, which is what we're a part of. These were things, um, basically what happened with Luther was that for a long time, all those years, kind of where they were in that tree trunk with one church, the common people didn't really have, they weren't really literate, they didn't have access to the Bible, they couldn't read it for themselves every day. They heard stories and they heard the, um, they heard the priests talk about stuff and they saw art that kind of helped them understand, but for the most part, they didn't have access to read the Bible, they didn't get to know. And so, around that time was the same time the printing press was invented, and so all of a sudden, all of these people had more access to the Bible. And so once they started reading the Bible, they go, oh my gosh, some of this stuff doesn't actually, isn't actually, like, the practice, what the church is doing doesn't match up with what I'm reading here. And so um, they came up with these things that 
when they read the Bible, they saw these as really important, and they didn't see it matching what was going on. So these were our key ideas. The first one is grace and faith alone. So salvation is not found in works, but only in receiving the gift of God through faith. Not through sacraments, not through indulgences. Indulgences were a way of the Catholic Church where they would say, hey, if you pay me 20 bucks, your sins will be forgiven. Right? And so they were collecting all this money, and then they were building these huge cathedrals. And uh, Luther, and once they're reading the Bible, they're like, wait, that is not how that works at all. It's a free gift, it's by grace, and it's through faith. So that was kind of a, one of their big revolutions. Um, Christ alone. They saw Jesus Christ as our high priest. So if, in the Catholic Church they have priests. And um, Jesus Christ is the central priest. And so the priest is the one who mediates between God and people. Protestants believe that Jesus Christ alone functions as the mediator and the reconciler between God and humanity. So for them it would have been like all the common people look to the church leadership like the priests and the pope and those people. And those people would go to God for you and hope that they could get you forgiven. And when when they read the Bible for themselves, they were sort of like, no, like we have access to this personal connection with Jesus Christ, who is personally um, set, you know, forgives our sins, and we can interact with God, you know, one-on-one -on -one because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. And so um, that was kind of a new, a new shift, too. So give me the next one. The third one is scripture alone. The Bible is the sole authority in the Protestant church, the rule and life of faith. Not the church or the human being um, in a church like the Pope, but the Bible is in the hands of people and the language of the people. So really it was, it was by reading this Bible that they really were able to see, you know, this is the real authority, not somebody's interpretation of it. We've got to keep staying strong and go back to the scriptures. And then number four, all people are called to ministry. And this was new, too, because uh, for a while it was like, well, if you were really special, you could be called to ministry. You could be called to be in leadership of the church. And really, uh, what we've learned is that ministry is really the job of every single person in the church. So as you guys are joining the church, you are taking on part of that um, responsibility, part of that um, tradition of being a part of ministry yourself. And so... Uh, kind of what we've talked about is like, you know, God made you uniquely you. He, made, he designed you with a purpose. And part of that purpose is to be um, engaged in the ministry of the church, whether that's um, caring for one another, whether that's being, you know, having your own idea and taking it out into the world or, you know, going on city dives. All of you have work to do that benefits the kingdom of God. And then next slide, please. Okay, so, that means that it is, that kind of brings us back to our church. So we know that we're part of this big church family. We know that um, all of the people, all the Christians across time and space are part of our big church family. But what does it mean to be a part of the little C church? What does it mean that we're joining Smamish Presbyterian Church? And... Any of you guys who have ever logged into the Wi-Fi here probably know that our motto is no grow do. Yes, got that one memorized. Well, part of uh, part of what Pastor Jeff has been asking us to think about and think about is like, what does that really mean for our church? Why is why are those the three things that our church really wants to focus on? And the first one is kind of knowing Christ. Uh, you guys, I see you guys do this all the time, but really putting God first in your life. The second part is being a big church family, not like focusing on families. Hey guys. Um, not really like focusing on specific families, but knowing that we're a big church family together so that, um, you know, all the grandparents in there are all of our grandparents and all of the little kids coming up are all little kids that we're called to be part of their lives and help take care of them. And, um, that's why mentors are here for you guys, because not all of them even knew you, but they are part of your church family, and so they wanted to be your you know, aunts and uncles and know about you and um, make sure that you have the, the someone to talk to. 
to and listen to and ask questions about your faith with. And so we all know that we're kind of all connected together at this church. And the third one is um, mission-minded, do something about it. We want to live in a way that we are sent into this world. So as a community, we are hoping that Sammamish will be different because we're here. We're hoping that Seattle will be different because we're here. Hoping that this whole world will be different because we're here, the Christians and Sammamish Presbyterian Church. And we're called to be thinking of others and serving others in all that we do. So those are like the big three, the no, grow, do, are the big three things that as Sammamish Presbyterian Church, we really think are the, the most important. So that's what it means to be joining this little, little C church. All right, so give me, give me the next one. Next slide, please. No, maybe. What's the guideline to do that? So one of the ones that's traditional is a tenth of 10%. So that's a tithe. That's where that comes from. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good guideline. So, yeah. Um, so what I wanted to do was kind of give you guys a few examples of people around here who, um, you know, have really taken that as, kind of their own. And so I think we have a few student leaders who are willing to share. Yeah, why don't you come on up? Is Isaac around? Oh, he went up. somewhere. Isaac! Probably went to a few pictures. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, um, well, when he gets back, we can grab him too. Um, so I was going to ask you, since you, have you gotten your confirmation? Yes. Yes. And then you've decided to kind of be involved in ministry here, use your gift and time here. So what does it mean for you to kind of be in ministry here at SPP? Uh, I feel like being in student leadership and being in ministry is really, like, it's been a good opportunity to help people grow in their faith as well as help me grow in my faith. Just uh, being a mid-high leader or joining the band or being missions coordinator, it really helps you help people and help yourself all at the same time. Mm -hmm. What kinds of, like, when you're thinking about people who would be good, like, student leaders or whatever it takes to get involved in some area of the church, what kinds of things we look for? Uh, anything, honestly. Yeah. If you have good music talent, that's great. If you're good with numbers, anything. If you can talk, if you're strong in your faith, basically any talent you have can be used in student leadership. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks, Eric. So, yes. Um, okay, I didn't ask any of the mentors to prepare anything, but any of you guys want to share, like, why you uh, you know, kind of been invested here at church, or what's that meant to you, or why you decided to do something like that? Anybody willing to, just off the cuff doesn't have to be a good answer, just what, whatever you're thinking. Well, like, what, you know, what makes you want to participate in the church and use your gifts here? You know, I'm putting you guys on the spot. Um, I'll say something. Um, See, for those that don't know me, I'm Kent Abendroth, and uh, it, um, I've seen, but I have two kids, uh, they're both, well, uh, Jillian is, is, is uh, with IGM, she's in Guatemala right now, she's serving there. Uh, she grew up in this church family here, 
and, and uh, my son Austin as well. He's a sophomore up at Western uh, this year. But you know what I what I've experienced as a father is is just the growth that they each one of my kids have had through ministry here, and it's all because they had other youth leaders, not even really Amber or Josh. Well, actually Josh with Austin and, and Jillian, but. Um, you know, there's really not a price you can put on that for the guidance they received um, uh, because, you know, they get guidance from me as a dad, but they also need guidance from other um, adult leaders. And, like, for example, my son, Austin, has a really good relationship with uh, um, uh, a member of our church here, John Nowicki, and he's helping him kind of in his, his school career and choices about being a doctor and, and things like that. So, um, you know, there's... I just felt a real need to give back to want to, you know, help uh, other students because I've seen the benefit of how they, how my kids have also been, been supported in in their own uh, journey of faith. So, um, you know, it's really a privilege to be a mentor and help someone else that is ch coming along and, uh, you know, to, to guide them on their mm -hmm. journey. So, mm -hmm. that's cool. why you. I jumped in. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Yeah, and. I think what I'm trying to say to you guys uh, is um, you know I look at all these people who are like helping in youth ministry or showing up to be a mentor and they're really gifted people but mostly they were just willing to show up. They were just willing to kind of be themselves and let God use that and um, I think that's the kind of the cool part about the church is that when you are yourself and you, when you're authentic and when you're kind of caring about your faith, God's going to use that and um, use that in the life of other people. And so that's a great way to kind of be invested in the life of this church. When you become a member of SBC or committee, to kind of be invested here and to care about um, our big church family. So that's, that's part of it. So I have one last. Um, kind of example, and it's a clip from, since we're kind of in Final Four mode, it's from a basketball player, and it's kind of his story of how he took his own call to be who he was, to be a follower of Christ, and to kind of live that out, live this new way of life. So I'm going to let him talk for himself. I remember one particular moment that that I think really brought me to to, to a low point. We had just finished winning, um, you know, a big game, big nationally televised game. Um, I played well. Uh, the team had played well, and I remember being out uh, celebrating afterwards. I remember having some random guy um, didn't know who he was coming up to me and, and he basically said, man, Wayne, I, I wish I had your life. I remember as soon as he said that, it was, it was literally like I got punched in the face. On the inside, he really didn't know what was going on. He didn't really understand the, uh, the gravity and the magnitude of the unfulfillment that I had in my heart. It started out just as a, a young boy um, with a carefree attitude who was gifted with uh, some athletic ability and who just really enjoyed uh, to play sports. Just began to excel at, at basketball and you know that's when things kind of changed. I began to receive some notoriety uh, because of, of my athletic ability to win some awards and uh, what was once uh, something that I did for fun then turned into something that became a, a selfish ambition to receive you know, more glory uh, from other people uh, and from the things that I could attain from it. Just as I began to excel and and to achieve my dreams, whether it was in terms of championships, in terms of uh, going to 
the university that i always dreamed of playing at the university of kansas winning conference championships there and going to final fours having a future in the nba having access to drugs and alcohol and girls basically during that time i had everything that the world said should make you happy as a as a 20 year old college athlete but yet because i was so performance driven because i was so worried about what other people thought about me and wanted to gain their approval that at the first sign of of um of any conflict any struggle whether it was a loss uh, whether it was a poor performance whether it was an injury uh, whether it was public ridicule in the papers or by fans, um, emotionally I would just be crushed. Just remember crying out to God for Him to, to show me uh, someone or something. Lord, show me something that's truly worth giving my life to. A few weeks later, I would, I would run into some Christians. They shared with me the gospel in a dynamic way. They told me about Jesus Christ and the things that he had done with his life. They shared with me how he died for the forgiveness of my sins and that he had a purpose and a, and a plan for my life. And that's something that I'd never heard before. You know, God had something for me to do here on earth. I gave my life to the Lord in July 12, 2003, and my life was completely transformed um, from the inside out. I had played for myself and played for the applause of the crowd for so long that I really had no idea how to compete outside of that, and God had to show me how to do that. He showed me that, that I could compete and that I could play for, for His glory that I could compete and play and live as, a, as an act of worship to him for what he had done. And when that became the motivation of, of why I stepped on that court, um, that's where the freedom came, to where it didn't matter if I scored 30 points or if I didn't score any points at all, that if the posture of my heart, if the posture of of how I lived, if the motivation for why I did things was to glorify and honor God, uh, that I knew at the end of the day, He would be pleased with me. As that became the motivation of why I played, um, you know, those were the two best years of my career. You know, I became an All-American, Big 12 Player of the Year, and, and um, because of the freedom that came from, from playing and competing for Jesus. When I first walked into the locker room, there was a, a lot of skepticism. They heard that I was a Christian and their comments were, this won't last long. It was really intimidating. I can even remember a few of the guys on, you know, on the side literally taking cash money bets on me with how long it would take me to fall. You know, it, it, as time went on, as my rookie year uh, passed, then I had um, you know, remained firm in my faith and began to have the opportunities to share with my teammates in the NBA locker room and how Jesus had transformed my life. That's when I began to start to feel their support. They began to pull for me. It was amazing the lesson that I learned from that. It's not necessarily the, the championship ring, celebrating the champagne in the locker room, the parade uh, in the city, hoisting the championship trophy, but it was seeing how quickly that, that glory would fade. Moving on to the next year as the team struggled, swept out of the playoffs, and I can remember the Lord bringing a scripture verse to mind after that championship. First Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 24. The man in all his glory are like the flowers in the grass of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but it's only the word and the word of God that stands forever. Seeing how that eternal truth had 
matched up directly with the experience of winning that championship. Um, it's really when the Word of God and His will became something that I wanted to completely pursue. And it's really something that led me to, to step away from uh, professional basketball and to be a part of something that's not only going to influence and change my life, but have the influence to change the lives of so many people around me. And not just for a moment's time, but for eternity. It's a great feeling of knowing who you were made to be and to know what you were made to live for. My name is Wayne Simeon, and I am second.
still need, we still need to get you. Okay, so what were some of the things you guys were talking about? What were some of the things that it might look like for you guys practically to be a faithful member here? Yeah. Student leadership. Student leadership, good, you, that was a good example. What, what about it? We said, we talked a lot about doing like mission director and talking about like where we can help out in mission, like Team B, mm -hmm. East, even like Eastside Baby Corner, and even like Africa, if you want, that kind of stuff. Yeah. What else for you guys? Like practical things of what it means to be a member here. Yeah, I know for me, um, I volunteer a lot in the nursery, and so it's like, it's, I don't know, like giving back to the church, mm -hmm. helping keep babies for fun. <laughs> That's a good one. What about for you guys? Sometimes for me it means showing up to church when I don't feel like it. <laughs> and because, you know, I'm here a lot and um, I don't always feel like sitting through a 20 hour sermon. 20 hour? 20 minutes. <laughs> it feels like 20 hours. Really tired. Really. I mean, I always, I'm glad, I always enjoy it once I'm there, but sometimes going, I'm like, oh, I don't know. But then, so for me, being a faithful member here means, you know what? Showing up, being a part of it. What else for you guys? What could be some practical things? Besides just student leadership. Chip. 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 Come on, Chip is Chip's is a good one. Say Joining it. the band. Yeah, Chip. Joining the band? Yeah, absolutely. Tithing. Um, whatever it means to be a Christian at your school or that sort of thing. Yeah, all of those things. Awesome. Did you guys have any examples of someone who you seen do it really well? Isaac. Isaac, yay. Anybody else that you've seen like be a faithful member of this church? That you, did you guys get to that? Jeff? Jeff? Lindsay go? Yeah. You better be a faithful yeah. member of this church. You better. better. Yeah, Amber, definitely. I don't have any candy to give you today, but you can take that away. <laughs> Yeah, Ellie. Aaron Griggs, like before the game. Yeah, yeah, totally. Awesome. Okay, well, um, that's kind of our, that's kind of the charge for you guys, kind of the, as you go forward, as you guys get confirmed, um, is that what does it mean for you to follow Jesus Christ with your whole life, and what does it mean to be a faithful member of this church? So, um, those are the charges. So, that's kind of all the content we have to prepare today, but since it's our last time together before we do confirmation, I'm wondering if someone would kind of pray for us, pray for confirmation Sunday, and um, give thanks for all of our time together. Anybody willing to do that? Any students? I know you will. I'll wait patiently. I'll do, I'll do something. Casey. Casey Kelsey. All right, let's pray. Let's pray. Let's, let's pray. Hold on, hold on. Dear God, thanks uh, so much that we got to come here together every week and learn more about you and uh, grow in our faith and just learn about the Bible and about churches and this church in particular. I feel like we've learned so much and really grown as a really big church family. I pray that um, Confirmation Sunday will go well and that um, we'll, and those who will uh, get baptized will uh, get baptized and have fun, and it'll just be a great service in that people can see how far we've come in our faith. In your name we pray.